The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Leaders in Law presentation. This series of webinars is hosted by Fast Case Legal Research. Before we begin, uh, we have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, the first announcement, you may have noticed that you're currently in listen-only mode. This is to cut down on the amount of background noise so everyone can hear our great presenters today. However, you are welcome to ask questions at any point during today's webinar. On your screen, you should still have the GoToWebinar pop-up, and on that pop-up is the questions button. Any question you ask there will be uh, reviewed and uh, we'll try our best to answer it during the session. Our second announcement, today's session is not for CLE credit. We do offer some CLE webinars. They are available from FastCase directly. And to sign up for those webinars, please go to fastcase.com forward slash webinars. All right. Uh, so with that, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for today's Leaders in Law session. Today, we have some fantastic panelists. And I want to ma make sure that everyone has a chance to see their full curriculum vitae. These are some really fantastic, excellent, learned people that are going to be speaking to us today. But for a short, quick intro for everyone so that we have as much time as possible on the subject, uh, our panelists today include Ann Tucker. She is a professor of law at Georgia State University, the director of legal analytics and in the innovation initiative. We also have joining us Hannah Gorman, the director of the Balanced Justice Project out of the Florida International University. We have Anusha Gillespie. She is the vice president of solutions lead at United Lex and the formal global co-head of innovation at Evershed Sutherland. And we have with us Ryan Fitzpatrick, who is a 1L out of Hofstra University, a data analyst intern for Evershed Sutherland, and a former product intern with Docket Alarm, Fast Case's sister product. We also have a couple of other fantastic people joining us. So this is going to be a very packed, very exciting session. I really encourage any questions, again, to that questions box, and we'll go ahead and get started. Anna. Thank you very much uh, for having me here today and thank you for everybody joining us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I am conscious of time and I would say this presentation uh, really symbolizes the fact that it really does take a village to be able to do the, the work we're going to be talking to you about today. Um, with that being said, my, my first message to you all is I am double hatting a little bit today. Uh, the first hat I'm wearing is as the director of the Balanced Justice Project, which is at FIU Law. Um, BJP, as we call it, it's an initiative falling under the nonprofit arm of the university, so FIU Foundation. And that is basically to say we, we receive in-kind resources from the law school all that good stuff, IT support, Westlaw, library access, um, and a desk. Um, and we're based uh, in, in the basement, uh, which is the, where the location of the law clinic is at FIU. Um, what do we do? We bring together current practitioners, scholars, the next generation of uh, students from a variety of disciplines, all with a view to providing a holistic approach to criminal justice and in particular defense work. Uh, to this end, our key priorities is to train and recruit people from a diverse skill set and background to do this work. So, of course, law, uh, social and forensic science, journalism, filmmaking, English majors, etc., you name it. Um, and we are also focused on encouraging those who have spent time inside under detention and those who have been exonerated to, to join our team too. We have been working on our Zinger line and this is the best we have. Please feel free to give us feedback. But when we get down to it, what do we do? We're implementing data, life history investigation, which is also known as mitigation specialist work and creative alternative tools such as defense initiated victim outreach or restorative justice circles where appropriate to humanize the vulnerable 
um, detained people and empower community to promote a fair criminal justice system. We do assist with the question of guilt, but we prioritize sentencing issues with a focus on cases of juveniles charged as adults, foreign nationals, and the most severe penalties, which brings us nicely to the Florida Center for Capital Representation, which sits under the umbrella of the Balanced Justice Project. My second hat is Amicus. Um, Amicus is a UK-based charity that fights for justice on death row. Another way of saying that is they provide assistance to defense teams uh, from under-resourced officers in the form of interns and remote casework teams. Um, indeed, it was Amicus who put me on the path I'm on today, uh, having sent me out to, to Mississippi some 17 years ago now. Um, Amicus has been critical in supporting the work that we're talking about today um, by sending volunteers to our office uh, pre-pandemic time, but also essentially coordinating and helping to train a network of amazing lawyers who have been able to provide pro bono assistance. Just to give you an idea of this, I'm talking about 12, maybe up, up to 15 different law firms at any one time located around the world. And we are reaching a number of in excess of 400 individual attorneys who have contributed their time to this project. Abishad, so you're going to hear more from being a key uh, leading firm in this work. So focusing on our data component, I'm going to move to our next slide. Um, to basically encompass why we're doing this. And I pinched this tweet from Georgia Lupi, who I think accurately captures what I'm trying to say. That is to say, empirical evidence is essential. It is about understanding the policies and law that we have developed and monitoring its impact on humans. Um, we get lost in the figures. It's one of the reasons why I encourage everybody on our team to not only do some casework, um, so you get to sit opposite uh, the people we are helping, as well as the data work, because we need to keep that fire in our belly and remember that these numbers are humans. Um, so we're using the data to humanize our system and understand how it is being applied, determine whether it's constitutionally being applied, and evaluate uh, new strategies that we are, are trying to implement to see if they are working. We also have the law on our side. Um, in particular, I, I like to call this slide life by numbers, but I suppose most accurately, it is called death and life by numbers. And this, this really is to, to demonstrate, and I'm not gonna go into these cases in any detail uh, today, and they may indeed be cases that you are very familiar with already, but just by way of setting the stage for us, we know that the law is on our side, in relation to empirical evidence and its critical nature. Um, a snapshot of cases here focused on death penalty work. So Furman and Georgia being our, our landmark case, analyzing and looking to figures that might demonstrate the way that we apply the death penalty is arbitrary. And whilst there are numerous references to empirical evidence in that case, um, and by no means is there a judicial consensus um, about those empirical studies, but there is reference to discrimination, the factors influencing it, concern about race, gender, socioeconomic status and politics. Um, and certainly there is a determination from the justices in that case that there was an inconsistent determination of who was going to live and die. And that was the basis of the violation of the Eighth Amendment. In more modern times, um, we see similar arguments in, in Glossop and Gross, although not so focused on the death penalty per se, but focused on the question of the death penalty in the context of lethal injection. However, we see in the dissents Justice Breyer emphasizing again the importance of empirical evidence and calling for more studies um, that would lay the foundation for examining the constitutionality of the death penalty per se. Uh, we also see the application of empirical evidence studies um, to provide context for the evolving standards of decency. Um, I've put a couple of examples up there for you, Roper and Simmons, in relation to the uh, 
um, prohibition of executing under 18s and also the intellectually disabled. In both of those key cases, we see the justices going back to the evolving standards of decency and its application of the Eighth Amendment. And as a part of determining what that is in the modern world is by looking to global practice and certainly national practice of what is happening elsewhere in the US and around the globe um, in terms of developing our norms for these standards. Um, good examples of that are coming up in a second in the context of, of the international platform. In Hildalgo, again, a more recent case, um, one that was not successful, but we do see Ginsburg um, joined by Breyer, Kagan, um, specifically noting empirical evidence um, demonstrating a failure in the capital sentencing scheme to narrow the number of first degree murder defendants eligible for the death penalty. We know from Furman that the death penalty is only constitutional if it's reserved for the worst of the worst. There are issues in understanding those ratios and the discretion, um, which is somewhat bridled by statute, but the, the, the large discretion that the prosecutors have in determining who is a death case and who is not. Uh, so very much looking to empirical studies to, to analyze that. More recently, we have state uh, versus Gregory, uh, Washington State found its capital sentencing system to be in violation uh, on the basis of empirical evidence provided by the Beckett Report demonstrating uh, racial discrimination. By a backdrop, um, we also see McCleskey and Kemp, not quite, quite the opposite result. Um, uh, no abolition there, but we see the infamous Boulder study demonstrating that black defendants are three times more likely to be sentenced to death than similarly situated white defendants, and also clearly indicating that it is not simply the race of the defendant that has to be analyzed, but also the effect of the race of the victim. So I just want to quickly put us into context before handing over, and I'm going to uh, whistle through and just give you the nuts and bolts. We can we can get into uh, to, to all of the, the weeds another time and feel free to ask questions about it. This um, is mainly to make the point. These two images in our Amnesty International report, these are older images than the recent report, which just came out um, 21st of April, 21. Uh, I prefer these images, uh, but there's, there's more, more uh, recent images if you want to see them. Um, the reason why I like these particular images is I think just visually it hammers home the message. Um, as of the 2021 report, which is no doubt impacted by the COVID pandemic, we can see that the US for the 12th year running uh, remains the only country carrying out executions in the Americas. Um, we have seen a dramatic decrease in executions and sentencing uh, over the years, but <laughs> more dramatic. 26% uh, decrease in terms of executions and 36 in relation to sentencing because of the pandemic. Um, you will note um, that these images have, have the US uh, in seventh position there, but as of the most recent, the US has climbed back up to sixth position in terms of leading worldwide executions. And you can see who they are falling behind. It doesn't change much in the 2021 report behind China, Iran, Egypt, Iraq, Saudi, with Somalia and Yemen, and also India uh, following up behind. Um, suffice to, to say, the death penalty, whilst it's practiced worldwide, this judicial taking of a, of a person's life is not practiced everywhere. If we take the UN's number of countries, about 75% of the world that either, either is abolitionist or de facto abolitionist. And most recent ab abolitions coming in from Chad, Ka uh, Kazakhstan, and Malawi just last month. And in the context of the US, we, um, we see that Colorado was the 22nd state to abolish in 2020. And actually just last month as well is Virginia becoming state number 23. So when we're taking a closer look at the US, if we could just flash forward to the, the next slide so we can see that image, thank you. Um, you can see that, well, there are now 24 states with the death penalty, 
um, 23 without taking into account Virginia's recent uh, abolition, and we still have three govern governor-imposed moratorium. Um, moving forward to Florida, because one of the things we have to understand is Florida, whilst we looked at that map and we can see a large amount of red for who is still active, Florida really is a critical region. It's the largest active death row in the nation with a population of at least 300. Um, 330 today, I can tell you according to the DOC, but some of those uh, records are inaccurate and fail to take into account the various, thing, various resentencing reviews as a result of Hearst. Um, we in Florida also add to the population of those under a sentence to, um, of death uh, at a higher rate in comparison to any other state. Uh, Texas follows us closely behind that. Um, Texas beats Florida in terms of its execution rate, but Florida is number two. Um, and even during the pandemic, Florida sentenced four people to death. Uh, in addition to all of this, Florida has the worst or best, depending on how you look at it, exoneration record with just under 20% um, of all exonerations across uh, 28 uh, different states. Finally, in addition to all of this, and I realize it's a whistle stop tour, but Florida's death penalty statute has twice been held unconstitutional in the last four, almost five years. Um, and at the time, when Hearst versus Florida came down from the Supreme Court, there was chaos in Florida. Uh, we had a standstill in death penalty cases why we began to quickly rewrite the death penalty statute. And the questions were being asked, how many people is this gonna impact? How many people are in the pipeline? Um, again, right, data, just simple data. Um, and we couldn't answer it. So that is when I embarked upon the work of trying to answer that question. And here, what you see, is our 67 counties, 20 judicial circuits, um, a bunch of names all over the wall, mainly because our former director uh, didn't like Excel or any other database that you can imagine, any electronic platform. And indeed, my office began to be taken over with information of people and names. Um, what is key to what we were doing is Initially, it was just me, but that became impossible because we were also updating. This data is live and we extract from it. So we are constantly reviewing. Um, was just me, then a team of interns, and now, as I mentioned, the 400 plus pro bono lawyers going through the cases that um, we have been given in responses to public records requests. And just so you have an idea of that, again, uh, state attorneys, 20 of them. Clerks of court, 67 of them. So it is a lot of FOIAs and tracking, et cetera. Um, and to be able to allow those 400 plus attorneys to be able to help us, that required developing a system that was user-friendly to multiple authors. Um, so it's constantly changing. Um, what we did do is highlight a huge discrepancy early on by looking at a similar sample. Um, so this image on our next slide that you will see is um, actually this, this is normally a video, but for sake um, and simplicity, let's move straight on to the results. You don't need to see my British themed musical video, uh, but this is just something I put together. Um, what you can see here is a snapshot of a 10 year period of death sentences by county and circuit in Florida. And this really goes to the unusual argument of the Eighth Amendment. It's analyzing where the majority of our sentences come from. And the upshot here um, is there's some really fun stuff we can get into into comparisons, but I'm sure you're all looking at the huge, big, soaring red column there. Um, five of the 20 judicial circuits are responsible for 54% of total sentences, but that huge, big red column is one county, Duval County, um, which accounted for a massive, um, a massive 25% of all sentences during that period, uh, which led us to question why it was very similar patterns that were reported, re reported in Glossip and Gross. But when we began to look at it um, and crunch the numbers, compare them, put it into per capita, et cetera, 
the geographical variance couldn't be explained by population size, homicide rates, um, and whilst we can't yet point to, for example, race or age of offence, etc., all the different personal identifier variables you can imagine so far, what we can say is there is that geographical variance and it would appear to be linked to the way different state attorneys who are elected are applying the discretion that they are given by law to make the decision on whether to file a notice or not. Um, this really is just a nice way to symbolically put our visuals up on there. Uh, this is Ramas Ayala. You may have seen her name all over the papers when she, uh, four years ago, five years ago, uh, took to the steps of court and announced that she would no longer seek the death penalty having been elected. It created mayhem. It created a lawsuit. Governor Scott removed all of her first degree murder cases and gave them to another state attorney from a different jurisdiction. Um, Ayala, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, lost her legal arguments in relation to that um, and walked back her decision establishing a death penalty policy that would ensure at least seven members of her team reviewed potential death cases. Moving on, we began to crunch the numbers. This is very basic uh, descriptive stats for us. Um, but we were able to see that similar variations were happening in relation to the pre-trial cases, right? Not just looking at the death sentences, but looking at the rate in which different state attorneys are seeking death. And what you can see on our left-hand side is our ratios. It's the rate of seeking death. So the proportion of first degree murders that are turning into death noticed cases. And what you can see on the uh, other side, the right hand side, is a calculation of the impact of Hearst. And um, that is namely to say, without getting into all of Hearst versus Florida impact, um, is we a good number of cases became pretrial again, because over a third of the row um, had their death sentences vacated, not quite overnight, but within 12 months of those decisions, and were having a retrial um, or penalty phase. And what we at least know at this stage is that the impact of this on, on Hearst's, um, of Hearst on Florida's death row, uh, really highlights the arbitrary nature, uh, not just of the legal decisions, um, the application of the constitution, but the state discretion. So if we just skip forward, we can see a, Mardi Gras pie chart, the people who love Mardi Gras, great. The people who love pie charts, great for everybody else. I am sorry, this will look like a horrible, disgusting image. Uh, but what I am really trying to point out to you is the, um, the spotted shaded part, which is gray. It covers the green and uh, yellow sections. These are all people under a sentence of death who had a non-unanimous jury recommendation. Um, and following Hearst, the statute changed to make that a requirement. Florida is an outlier on that. Uh, what you see is the between the green and the yellow, the green are folks who get a resentencing because they're eligible for a redo under the application, uh, the retroactive application of the change of law. The yellow do not. They're essentially, for simplicity, they are too old. Uh, if it's too old, docket delays, lawyers went off on holiday, pushed them over that key uh, ring versus Arizona decision of the 24th of June, 2002. The reason why I highlight this this way is because the yellow and green are the same, but for timing. So this really does show the way the court split uh, the baby for one of the different grays um, there and the arbitrary application of uh, the new law. Uh, effectively, a third are getting screwed, a third are getting a second bite at the cherry. But what we're also seeing is a good number of those old death penalty cases becoming life. So, key, very critical information, but there was so much more to be done, and we needed help doing that, which is why we began to assemble a team beyond uh, the pro bono attorneys, myself, Amicus, interns at the law school. Um, to really gain some skill sets in legal analytics. And at this point, I'm going to hand you over uh, 
to Anne Tucker to, to take us through um, the role that GSU played um, and Dock at Alarm in really helping us to propel uh, what we were doing, which to this stage was just manual reviews. So lawyers looking up cases on dockets, pulling the key documents and entering the information into our database. Over to you, Anne. Actually, Eileen, if you would. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aileen Krausen, Director of Pro Bono and Responsible Business at Evershed Sutherland. And I'm here really to introduce Anusia Gillespie, our former co-head of innovation who really built this team and formed the collaboration. Our firm has a long history of death penalty work. Just a few months ago, we won our most recent vacation of the death penalty for a pro bono client. So Hannah's project was really attractive to our lawyers and we're very lucky to be a part of it. But let me just say, I know nothing about data science, so this wasn't originally on the radar of our pro bono team. Anusha, however, was really forward thinking about how data science could benefit access to justice initiatives, and she's responsible for connecting all of today's panelists. So in introducing her, I'd also just encourage everyone on this webinar to think about your own connections to the access to justice and public service space and imagine how you could form a similar partnership to this to benefit our communities at large. Uh, Anusha was that person for us, and we're really grateful for her leadership. So uh, turning it over to Anusha. Thank you, Aileen. That was a very kind introduction. Um, and I'll be quick here. I just wanted to um, provide some background on how this came together to empower the listeners, um, because I think that all of this work can seem really overwhelming, but it's just getting the right people into the right spots and um, continuing the momentum of people kind of understanding where they're uh, contributing value. Uh, and, and Aileen uh, makes a good point that um, a lot of pro bono departments within law firms are not necessarily um, completely engaged and integrated with some of the other services available within uh, the firm. So knowledge services, if you have an innovation team, if you have technology people. And what was really interesting about this is that I had spent a lot of time, I was the um, global co-head of innovation at Evershed Sutherland with responsibility for the US. And I had spent a lot of time on language because the word innovation didn't mean very much to anyone. And so I started being really specific of innovation is data, it's legal tech, it's process, it's design, it's digital. Those are the words to, to think of and use, and, and those are the tools at our disposal. And what was interesting about this was that language and getting everyone speaking the same language worked really well because it was actually our PR um, professional who came to me and said, you know, I was just speaking with Aileen in pro bono and she said that they have a data project. And I, she said, you should go talk to her. And so because we were speaking the same language of, of what kind of problem we're trying to solve, we were able to connect some of those dots. So I spoke with Aileen and said, you know, tell me more about this. And she said, um, you know, we have all these attorneys interested in this work, but there are some engagement issues because there's a lot of manual repetitive processes. And I said, well, that's, that's great. <laughs> we can actually, we can fix that. There's a lot to do there. Um, and so I think there's just so much opportunity to use the tools of innovation um, in, within pro bono. And so from there we went with, okay, um, let's see if this is something that Amicus is even interested in, if they have an appetite for this, um, and, and Hannah as well. And it was really interesting because Hannah had made a comment of, you know, wow, um, we're used to working with law firms who provide attorney support, but we haven't had conversations about this kind of operational support before. So yes, please, like, let's, let's talk about that and go down that path. Um, and so then I looked out into kind of my network and the ecosystem of who's doing what in data in law. Um, and fortunately I had um, some understanding and connections at GSU, um, at Fastcase and Docket Alarm to be able to put this team together and have everyone come in and say, okay, th this is where I can contribute value and understand that um, so that people weren't just kind of coming to a meeting. They, they knew exactly what their mission and goal was in that, in all of our, um, communications and work together. 
So that was how it kind of got started. And, and I would encourage and empower um, people on this call to, to kind of think that way and, and where can we fit um, some of the innovation tools into pro bono. Um, and and where we started too, you know, was first with GSU and then I'm gonna pass it to Ryan to talk about one of the first hurdles that we came across, which was how do we get all of the data that we need to then process and, and pull out actually what's useful and some of the insights um, that that um, Hannah and, and her team really need. So that's the story of kind of how the, the team came together. And Ryan, I'll, I'll pass it to you for the, the first piece of that of, of how we, what we needed to do to actually get the data. Thanks, Anusha. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Fitzpatrick. I interned at Docket Alarm last summer ahead of my first year of law school, and I helped collect the data for this project. I started learning Python during undergrad from a great book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python by Al Swigart, and then later took an online course called um, Google IT Automation with Python on Coursera. From there, I just did some experimenting on my own. And then during my internship, I worked closely with Michael Sander, the founder and lead developer of Docket Alarm, which is coded in Python, Nina Jack, the chief product officer, and Sean Tate, the managing director of content and data. Uh, for anyone on the call not familiar with Docket Alarm, it's a docket research alerting and analytics tool with a database of almost 500 million dockets and documents, all federal documents, 28 states, and special federal agency databases, such as the Orange Book and Patent Application History. Um, I learned more about the Docket Alarm API by helping Michael Sander convert his demonstration of the API on GitHub to the newest version of Python, Python 3. And the API or application programming interface allows developers to integrate Docket Alarm's functionality into their own applications. Um, Nina, Jack, and Sean Tate introduced me to the Death Penalty Data Project and showed me that they had Excel sheets filled with docket numbers and they needed a way to download everything from the Excel sheets in that format uh, onto the user's computer quickly. So I used the Docket Alarm API to make a script that would take in an Excel sheet as input and automatically download all the PDFs from each docket onto the user's computer. I then presented my script to the team and everyone seemed to find it useful. Uh, from there, Michael sharpened my Python skills by showing me how to make the program run faster and better. And he showed me how to publish it to the Python package index so other developers could use it. In my uh, last test that I ran before leaving to start law school, I downloaded the PDF documents for 90 dockets in 25 minutes, but that can vary depending on your internet connection and other factors. Um, toward the end of my internship, I met with Ben Chapman, professor at Georgia State and executive director of the Legal Analytics and Innovation Institute, who would tell me what kind of features would be useful to implement and any potential problems that needed fixing. Uh, today, I'm proud to remain in touch with Michael Sander who shared that the code that I wrote continues to be used today and that he's found other uses for it since. Um, the code's available for Docket Alarm subscribers to use or modify uh, through Docket Alarm's GitHub page. And that's about it for me. Um, thanks so much everyone for having me on. And next I'm delighted to introduce Ann Tucker, Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Legal Analytics and Innovation Initiative at Georgia State University College of Law. Thank you, Ryan. That's, uh, it's been really great to see your progression through this project. And then Ryan just successfully completed his first year of law school. So big kudos to Ryan and clearly on track to have, um, to have an impactful career. So let me talk to you for just a moment about legal analytics at Georgia State University College of Law. And then we'll talk specifically about our, um, our role in this project. So, the mission for legal analytics at Georgia State is we want to work at the intersection of data science and law to create new legal data sets, develop original methodologies, and uncover insights that increase the legal system's equity, transparency, and access. And we have a vision of a legal system that embraces data as a way to solve intractable problems and create a more fair and just society. So when we talk to both practicing lawyers in our community, as well as students at our law school, we want them to think about data as a tool, uh, a, another quiver in, or another arrow in the quiver of a lawyer's toolkit. And what we want folks to think about is data and working with data can be another type of fact that has incredible potential for persuasion and to illustrate um, concepts and data is a way to take an argument out of conjecture and into something that's concrete. 
And we see a lot of power for that in advocacy, and we see a lot of demand for that in practice. So we're trying to equip our students with the tools to not only be practice ready, but to be future ready as well. And the way that we implement this is we have uh, courses for our law students that focuses on data fluency, that focuses on basic computer programming, and then they have a capstone experience where they get to do an applied legal analytics research project, which is the one that you've been hearing about today. Um, so students in our applied legal analytics lab uh, chose this death penalty project as their capstone experience. And it was a combination of law students and um, students in our business schools Masters of Science in Data Analytics program. And they conducted the research you're going to hear about um, largely on their own. It was under faculty supervision, um, but this is largely the work of the students that we'll be sharing. Uh, next slide, please. So when we undertook this project, we had um, two broad goals. We wanted to do general data gathering and analysis so that we could create, um, and from there we wanted to create a workflow with executable code as well as Tableau dashboards for the client to help probe the application of prosecutorial discretion in Florida and start answering questions about apparent geographic or racial disparities that might exist within the system. We wanted to do this both for research as well as for individual advocacy. So we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we want to present some of our main findings from this project, but before I present that or proceed to that, I need to give a caveat um, not all counties' uh, death penalty data is reflected. So we need to treat this as a sample, not as the universe. Um, we had imbalance data and that a majority of our cases are coming from the Jacksonville metro area. And we had very little representation from Miami, the 11th Circuit, or Orlando, the 9th Circuit. And this speaks to the fractured system of state court data and the limitations and difficulty that lack of transparency and access to data can create for both researchers and even more importantly for practitioners who are engaged in capital representation like the work that Hannah and her colleagues do. All right, so next slide, please. Here, uh, reading the chart from left to right, we have the most common aggravators across all documents. So the aggravators are the triggering circumstances that make the death penalty applicable to this particular case. Now, if you can advance the next animation, please. Um, we have, there we go. Uh, these are our top or most frequent aggravators. Um, the most common one is H. It's um, in, our, in our darkest red bar there. And that is for the trigger of a heinous crime. The other top um, aggravators uh, include uh, fel or committed during a serious crime, um, B, threat of violence or a previous felony, or um, I, being premeditated um, premeditated and serious. And then our last one is F, which is in pursuit of pecuniary gain. And if you don't have a background in the death penalty, those all sound like reasons, perhaps, that um, a crime is more serious than another. But Hannah help to educate our students that a lot of these have no um, defined boundaries. So what counts as in pursuit of pecuniary gain? Is it all drug deals, all carjackings, all potential robberies? Um, what counts as heinous um, is not defined in the law and it is left largely to a uh, prosecutorial discretion, et cetera. So we found it interesting that the aggravators with the most discretion are also the ones that are most frequently applied. So we're going to come back to the theme. We're going to continue to see um, these as our top or our most prevalent aggravators, even when we dig down in a couple of ways. So if we can go uh, advance two times, please. There we go. And just to note that this uh, represents 100% of our documents, but not 100% of all cases. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So here we're digging into um, the race of our defendants, the percentage of, of defendants by race. And we're going to focus primarily on uh, defendants that are identified as black and defendants that are identified as white. Uh, we had incomplete data for, um, for Asian defendants and we also had what we think is likely incomplete data for Hispanic defendants. We're gonna focus on these two categories. Um, and if you look to uh, the table on the right here, we're looking at um, 
the prevalence of, of death penalty cases based on the race of the defendant and the race of the victim. Um, I'm sorry, can you advance two slide or advance two animations, please? And then two more. So again, looking over um, at defendant race and victim race here, we're going to focus on um, black and white. If you'll advance one more time, please. One thing that I want to note is that we have 54% of the defendants facing the death penalty are black. This does not match the overall population in Florida where the population is only 16.9% identified as black. Similarly, um, if we look at death penalty, uh, we see a higher, we see um, higher percentages uh, black on black um, and white on white. And this matches larger data around uh, the most occur frequently occurring crimes are within the same race. Um, but this idea that we have a much higher representation in the death penalty pool than in the population speaks to these questions of uh, larger racial disparities. If we can advance to the next slide, please. So here I want to dig into race a little bit more. Um, so once again, we've got a slice of our data where we're looking at black, white, and Hispanic defendants, but we're focusing on our black and our white defendants. And if you can advance the next animation, please. Um, the call out boxes will again focus on our most frequently occurring aggravators. And if you look at each of these categories, um, you're going to see that um, the black defendants have the highest representation in their categories. And again, these are the categories with uh, prosecutorial discretion. So reading from left to right, um, B is a previous felony or threat of violence. Um, D is a serious crime. F is pecuniary gain. H is heinous. And I is premeditated and lacked moral character. Um, again, next animation, please. Uh, what is particularly interesting with category B, the first call out box on the left with the highest percentage of black defendants, um, this also reflects the fact that one in three black men have a felony conviction. Um, so when you think about structural barriers and structural predispositions, um, if a prior felony is grounds to warrant a or trigger a death penalty in a new case, um, prior the prevalence of prior felonies will create racial disparities here as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so here we're looking at aggravators broken down by jury recommendation. And I wanna highlight the role of the jury because we focus a lot in this project on prosecutorial discretion, but in the pipeline of a death penalty case, discretion doesn't end with the prosecutor, but also involves uh, the juries that are, are sitting in on these cases. Um, one thing to note is whether it is a death or a life sentence, that's the bar charts you see at the bottom of, um, of the slide. The most common aggravators are the same, and again, they are the ones with discretion. So B, threat of violence or felony, D, committed during a serious crime, F, pecuniary gain, H, heinous, and I, premeditated. So our patterns persist. Uh, when we dig down by race, and then when we dig down by uh, jury recommendations as well. Can you advance to the next slide, please? So we were able to do additional analysis, such as co-occurring aggravators, looking at the data at zip code, county level analysis, age, um, and then I'm trying to understand what's driving the least commonly used aggravators. But in, uh, the, in for the interest of time, we'll save those for Q&A. If we can advance to the next slide, please. I want to highlight three points um, of the following slides. And this is to Anusha's point earlier that innovation can be a hard concept to define and an even harder concept for those new to the field um, to conceptualize and see how it might be applied to them. So I wanna share with you uh, quickly how the students did this work and what tools drove the legal analytics research aside from the great team that Anusha put together um, and the time invested in learning uh, in learning these skills. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So first, uh, the first tool that we used is a machine learning classification program. And as a quick primer for those that aren't already familiar, machine learning describes any type of computer program that or algorithm that improves automatically through experience, and it learns without being explicitly programmed. 
This will be in contrast to the rules-based approach that I'll talk about in a moment. And we have examples of machine learning in our everyday use. They're all around us, anywhere from Spotify to Apple Music. And if you can go to the next animation, we um, see it easily in uh, what our spam filters do in our email. Um, for those of us who have automatic junk folders, that is essentially a learning feature to identify um, relevant versus irrelevant email. And anytime you go and move an email from the spam folder into the inbox or vice versa, you're helping that algorithm learn what your particular preferences are more clearly. So let's apply this to our project at hand. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, in our project, our students built a, a two-step binary classification model to label our documents. Um, out of all the documents that Ryan and his team acquired for us, we needed to sort into uh, the documents that had uh, the relevant information about aggravators versus those that did not. Um, so our first classifier um, was able to perform at 90% accuracy in separating documents that had aggravators from those with no aggravators. And then we had a second step classification model that further sorted out um, amended documents from, from original documents so that we could make certain we had um, sort of the, the last and best representation of the case. And again, students were able to um, achieve this second step at over 95% accuracy. All right, let's move to the next slide, please. In addition to machine learning methodologies, we also use traditional tools of textual analysis. And we can move to the next slide. I want to say one, um, I, there was some additional pre-processing using a, a pretty interesting approach called um, cosine similarity that identifies uh, documents uh, based on, can provide a similarity score. And we were able to use this to identify duplicates, withdrawals, and strikes. Um, we also, on our text analytics pipeline, extracted dates and, and extracted the aggravator text before converting that all the variables. The variables, of course, are what you saw in our findings presentation. Um, if we can move to the next slide, and I think this will be my last one that I point out, all right? Great, thank you. So um, here, this illustrates the concept of extracting text, and this also will illustrate the concept of a rules-based approach. So we could have used a classification model to extract the aggravators, but the rules-based approach was very useful in this context because as is often the case in law, there's lots of textual variation in dynamic cases. There's also room for human error. Students wrote code to identify um, the text, the aggravator text that we are interested in using reg, regex programs. And these are rules-based. And when we say rules-based, we mean we're automating a control F function. So if you've ever had a long document and you're looking for a specific section, you might scroll through or you might use an index or you might control F and try and find the word or the phrase that you're looking for. Regex does the same thing. It allows students to write very sophisticated um, control F style functions that helps the program flag any document or any text that satisfies those rules and extract that text for later analysis. And some of these patterns are like what you see highlighted on the right. Things like we knew that the phrase threat of violence was associated with aggravator E. We knew that pecuniary gain was associated um, with F, et cetera. So that gives you a flavor of the main findings of the project, as well as um, the methodologies that the students used in this particular project, as well as methodologies that can be applicable to answer questions that you might encounter in your own practice. We can go to the next slide and pass it back over to Hannah. So impact-wise, uh, as you have just heard, we this is a sample. It's not the universe. And keeping that in mind, um, we can go some way to using the results. Um, and the ways in which we have done that tend to be by supplementing motions, uh, pre-trial motions, 
um, and pleadings in relation to sentencing and also a, a variety of other appeal issues predominantly related to Hearst and that um, the arbitrary line that I described earlier, um, although there are complex arguments uh, since then, and in particular um, in Florida during 2020, we received well at least five um, U-turn decisions from the newly composed Florida Supreme Court, so rescinding uh, a, all but one aspect of, of Hearst um, and placing jury unanimity in death cases potentially at risk. But as it stands right now, Florida statute still requires that. So it, it remains good law despite those decisions. But we have also seen, for example, a change in proportionality. Uh, one of the things during the, the Furman or post Furman Greg and era was a look to Florida's system in the way that its death penalty statute secured a automatic direct appeal that would analyze proportionality. Um, that is, is no longer the case. That was also one of the decisions um, of Lawrence in, in which the newly uh, composed court walked that back. So there will no longer be a comparative proportionality analysis on direct appeal for our death cases. So what that has meant is that we have been able to use the data we have so far as, as an indicator um, as to what is happening in these particular uh, circuits, but also across the state, and where we are able to compare that to data from other death penalty jurisdictions, we also provide that too. Um, and the onus really being on preparing now uh, at pretrial level to present that comparative proportionality analysis after you have a jury recommendation of death and you go into what we call in Florida a, a Spencer hearing um, where you are required to file memorandums um, for, for whichever side and, and sentencing preference uh, with law. Um, and we're supplementing that with, with data. And in addition, um, in those Supreme Court arguments, we are seeing um, lawyers who are analyzing the impact of Hearst and Lawrence and Phillips on intellectual disability uh, presenting this data there. But as to the future, um, what we want to do uh, is take this to the next level. So we are able to have a universe, right? And not just a sample. So we are able to make this data available and rerun it and get consistent results. Um, we have the legal psychology department with who I, I work closely um, at FIU, helping populate the missingness, um, preparing and cleaning up data so that we can run uh, statistical models demonstrating significance and keep running them <laughs> so we can ensure that consistency so one day we will be able to present them perhaps in a similar way to a Beckett report. Um, maybe the results are different but whatever that message is to accurately inform not just the lawyers um, and the judges but the community on how Florida's new modern death penalty statute is being applied and whether it is constitutional. Uh, so there is, there is a lot to do and there's all sorts of future other projects like focused on jury selection models and, and um, the application of um, strikes during that process. So lots going on, uh, but we're in the, we're in the, you know, the mix of it. We're in the weeds right now and our project's key focus uh, is really to try to find uh, the money that we can um, fund somebody who is full-time, who has analytical data management, computer science skills to be a part of our team to coordinate all of these moving parts. I think everybody um, will probably feel a little overwhelmed with the amount of hands that have touched this project at different stages and to go back to what Anusha was saying, it's it's okay. It's about putting the people in the right spots and working together, but having somebody who can coordinate that and run with it and be constantly pulling the extracts that we need uh, to answer the questions and queries we get um, would be critical. So that is our, our next step. Um, and also mine on a personal note was reading the book Ryan referred to or to make the boring stuff.
All righty. So we have a couple of questions from our great audience. I'm going to go ahead and uh, read the question. And uh, for any of our panelists, anyone who would like to respond, please feel free to. Our first question, uh, regarding the data that was acquired from the dockets and from other locations, uh, how do you address issues uh, that come up regarding the privacy or confidentiality of information that may be a part of the dockets? Is there a plan in place or a routine that you used to emphasize that possible privacy concern? Is that privacy concern tied up in the jurisdictions that did not have data available? This is Anne responding. I'll just say as a matter of course, when our students participate in the Applied Legal Analytics Lab, we have them sign a non-disclosure agreement we treat it as an external client engagement and ask them to treat it with the same level of confidentiality that they would with other legal matter. Um, we uh, just to note that anything from the documents, uh, they are, even if they're not easily accessible, they are public records. Um, so there was nothing that's included in those documents that wouldn't be appropriate for folks to be, for folks to be reviewing, at least on our team. Um, but I think the most important piece is how we uh, treated our clients' objectives and the access to, to knowledge that our students gain from working with the client. I mean, I was just going to, <laughs> going to say something similar. So what, what Anne said, um, but emphasizing that the system we have uh, in Florida in relation to the dockets, um, one of the things Florida is very progressive with is, is access um, and freedom to, inf to access information. Um, sunshine laws are great on that. So we can access a, a lot and it is everything that we are accessing via the dockets is public record. Excellent. And then we have a second question. Uh, you mentioned during today's presentation that there have been a lot of recent U-turn decisions or decisions that have limited recent cases. Do you see this as a continuing trend? Do you think that there will be a greater turn toward more liberal application of the death penalty? Or do you think that this is just a temporary change based on the makeup of the court? Uh, great question. Um, I'm not very optimistic uh, that we will see a, a change in terms of the composition of the court to, a, a, to more liberal leanings in the context of the death penalty. Um, I guess the, there is a potential um, of some kind of crazy pandemic impact right on these on these decisions, but at the rate that they were coming out and the undoing of years, hundreds of years worth of precedence in Florida. Um, those five decisions that, that I referred to, they are they're by no means minor. They really are undoing hundreds, well, hundreds of years worth of precedence in Florida and critical, critical uh, protections for those who are facing the most extreme of penalties, uh, the taking away of their life, um, that really just established reliability of convictions and um, protections, uh, due process safeguards. So I'm, I'm not optimistic in that, but um, we also have to put that in the context of the role of politics and, and, and the playing of that in terms of the appointments of the Florida Supreme Court. But um, just to give you sort of the heads up on that, what we saw on the Hearst composition of the court, uh, the, the Chief Justice, now is the lone dissenter in the recent decision that you turned on the decision. So really for me, um, and certainly my legal education and experience is, is Florida is doing a lot more um, than just simply you turning on some death penalty decisions. They really are undoing a tremendous, tremendous record of history of procedural safeguards and doing away with the concept of stare decisis. Uh, incredible instability with changing laws just like that. Fantastic. We have one more question, and I believe this is aimed more at Anusia and Aileen. Um, in the context of a firm, where do you recommend starting the process for gathering a team such as this? 
Do you recommend looking at current projects of the firm? Do you recommend starting a new project? And what types of resources do you recommend looking at first? Wow, that is a big question. Um, I think that if there are resources and projects already in play, if you can show value um, by accelerating those projects, um, I love this uh, phrase that um, I heard, you know, a week or so ago. That's value is realized at the point of application, which just means that people don't understand a lot of these concepts until it's in front of them and real. And oh, I get it now. Um, so the faster that you can get the, to that, the better. And that usually is with an existing project and plugging in there and showing value versus starting something from scratch, where then you have the tough job of selling it. Uh, building it and all of all, and building momentum around it, and then everyone's looking at you. Um, so I would say to, you know, interview and find different projects around the firm, find where they might connect. I got lucky with this one where our um, PR professional connected the dots for us around data, um, and then we were able to run with it. Um, but I, I would do kind of an analysis of projects around the firm, bring some internal people in. Um, we've had other projects where um, we had someone from knowledge services, someone from technology, someone from um, pricing, and, and everyone came together because a lot of these projects, people will invest, you know, they say, oh, I don't have time, but then when this project comes up, all of a sudden they have time because it's interesting and they're developing new skills and working with new people and so I wouldn't downplay the power of that at all and would instead actually tap into that um, because people like to be part of our, these kinds of new things um, so my my advice and two cents would be to, to find an existing place to plug in and show value quickly um, and don't be shy in asking the right people to get involved um, because you you might find they have great appetite for it excellent well, I think we hit all of the major questions that our audience had, so I'd like to take this moment to thank all of our presenters, panelists, and everyone who's been involved with this project. This has been a fantastic project for really applying the tools and the knowledge and the information that is a part of the law to issues that are fundamental concepts in the law. And I speak for our audience, I suppose, when I say that I look forward to all future work in this area and in related projects as well. And I'd also like to thank our panelists specifically for a great presentation today. Uh, this has been fantastic. And I'd like to remind our audience that after today's presentation, we will be sending a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording for today's session, as well as uh, slide materials from today's session. There is a great appendix with additional data analytics charts and information about the, the concepts and the information that was processed as a part of this project. I'd also like to remind the audience that we will be having future Leaders in Law sessions. Uh, keep an eye on your email for announcements as those come available. We have some really great presenters coming in the future as well. And again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for today's session. I hope that everyone has a great afternoon and keep in mind all of the wonderful information that was a part of today's presentation. Have a great one, everyone.